something to say. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. My name's Charlie. And I'm Brian. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't do the full, you know, you might know me better as C.E. Dorset thing, because Brian's here! Let's see, I here. snuck it in there. I snuck it in there. Yeah, I didn't really sneak anything in. Okay, so today we are going to do a long overdue review of the DreamWorks animated series Three Below, Tales of Arcadia, part dun, one. Dun, dun. That's a lot of words. A lot of words. Okay, so um, I want a few things before we get into spoilers because we like to do the no spoilery review part and then the spoiler review part. Number one, this series happens in the final season or part of Troll Hunters and does overlap significantly with that part. So if you're following along, you can connect it each part of this. Each episode, almost, you can slot right into its time frame within the Troll Hunters finale. It, it's quite fascinating because you're watching along and you're like, "Oh wait, that's right. This is coming up next, and this is you know like the Long Dark Night and stuff." I mean, all the you know you really can tie into different events from the Troll Hunter series, and uh, yeah. So, well, I wouldn't say that watching Troll Hunters is required for this show. If you remember the episode where the characters of uh, Asha and um, Krell appear, the series actually begins before that, includes a version of that episode, which is really interesting because it's a complete alternative version of that episode. So you see that episode from Asha and Krell's point of view rather than the Troll Hunter's point of view, which is... is fascinating but we'll talk about that more in spoilers yeah and it does go through the series so there are several points where it actually goes out of its way in a couple points to go oh and here's where we are and make a reference to troll hunters so that's number one i don't think you have to watch troll hunters to get it but it is really tied into the events of that series number two was it good um, if you like Troll Hunters, you'll like this show. Brian found the show most glorious, with the exception there needed to be more evisceration. <laughs> <laughs> That's Brian's best Varvatos Vex impersonation. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, like, Var Varvatos is one of those characters you'll you'll fall in love with right away. Yeah. The voice cast in this show is amazing. Yeah. Um, Nick Offerman does Vorvatos ve Vest um, Vex, Vex, and I have never heard Nick Which, Offerman. Yet again, if you're a fan of Nick Offerman in, in his various roles, you will enjoy the show, if for nothing else, than Vervatos Vex. Um, for those of you who are like, that name is familiar, but I can't place it, that Ron Swanson. I was going to be evil and say pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pancakes. Whiskey. <laughs> you know? It, uh, if, if, yeah. if you were a fan, like I said, if you were a fan of Troll Hunters, I think this show is a natural follow up to it. It has much mm. the same spirit, the same humor, a large overlap in voice cast. Senor Ul is actually really hilarious in this season and much more fleshed and out as you, a character. You get a lot more Senior Ul because in, in Troll Hunters, by the time he becomes principal, you know, you're, you're acting principal. Acting principal. They're not at the school much, so there's yeah. not much senior ul. Well, this is from the other perspective now, and so you're getting a lot more senior ul, or as they say, they're the prison learning center. And if you uh, <laughs> wanted to see Pepper Jack, weird X Files detective, if that's the show that you wanted, that's the show I thought we were going to get. To be honest yeah. with you, and there is some of that. Yeah, but. It actually focuses a lot more on Steve, mm -hmm. which initially concerned me greatly. Yeah, because the Steve character, you know. <laughs> Steve, Steve is a butt snack. Yeah. Which, if they can say that in a children's show, I can say that on a clean podcast. So, ha-ha. <laughs> yep. Um, 
yeah it's it i i didn't expect to actually like steve as much as i did they made steve into a likable character i mean i didn't hate well, they, him in the original series but they continue to show his evolution from complete butt snack to semi-decent person semi-decent person trying an, an aspiring decent person <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. He's an inspiringly most. decent person. <laughs> he 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 is clearly the hero of his own story, but he's not quite sure what that story is. Yeah. Um. Uh, all of the new characters I rather enjoyed. I like that the burrito man from the from Troll Hunters, because I believe he's only yes. referred to as the burrito man in the in Troll Hunters, becomes a fully fleshed out character in this yeah. series. No spoilers yet. And that is amazing, so we definitely understand why his Del Burrito Ta- Taco Supreme Diablo thingy is the killer of troll butts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, why it's so dangerous. Why it's so dangerous. I, I really liked that they fleshed him out as a character more. Again, a, something I did not expect at all from the series. One thing that I'm starting to expect from Guillermo del Toro children's series, it is much darker than I expected from a children's animated sh- series. And I think one kind of, before we even get into spoilers, warning for any parents that are wondering if it's appropriate for their kids, I can think of at least two th- to three characters that permanently die. Yeah, death is, a, I was about to say, death is a real thing. And uh, and yeah, there are, there are definitely, it's not that, you know, like, oh, you destroyed a robot death. It's, it's, this person is now dead. Yes. Death. Yes. And not as in like going to be resed later or revived later or rebuilt later. No, dead, gone. Yes, the fights definitely have stakes in this series a lot more than you would expect in a children's show. Like if you're thinking that because this is from DreamWorks, it's going to be kind of like the Race to the Edge series where, yeah, there are stakes, but it's more like, you know, oh, they only appeared to die. They're back in the next yeah. season. No, there are funerals, coffins. There, there's there, death does occur in this series if your child is not prepared for that and it's i, I will minor spoiler they're mostly bad guys but yeah i i just feel like you know yeah. I, I remember taking my niece to the lion king and we didn't realize what a traumatic experience it was going to be when mufasa died i guess it's the other way to put it there is body for proof of death. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess the way... Though not bloody. Not bloody. It's not bloody. It's not, it's not gory. No. But it's, death is a thing in this series. Yeah. It, it's definitely a thing in this series. So bear that in mind if when you're thinking about, is it going to be appropriate for my kids to watch this? You know, it's... It, it, I, I think it's fine. It's not... It's one of those things that it's... While it occurs, and if you're paying attention, it is there. I think a younger child might think that they were just knocked out. You know what I'm saying? Well, a younger child. It's it's the the because there's not you know there's no bloody gutty dismemberment or anything like that. That there is the point made that yeah they are dead, but it's not. It's not Mufasa in the Lion King. Yeah, they don't dwell on it. Yes. There you go. It, it does have an yeah. effect on the story. It does change the way certain characters act and react to each other. But it's it's definitely not Mufasa in the Lion King. It's, I, I'm sorry. To me, that's you know the gold standard because I, yeah. I remember all, I just a chorus of screaming children yeah. in the theater when that happened. And it's not... If anything, the kid will jump up and go, yes, <laughs> when most of them happen because they are bad guys. You know, so there's that. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it was really good. Yeah, definitely. Definitely recommend watching. Um, especially if, like me, you are a uh, fan of Diego Luna. Is that that's the one thing that gets me more than anything is Diego Luna voices krell there, there's a lot of like big name voice talent in this but diego luna is so funny as krell that i just don't know what to do okay so i don't think we have anything else to say before we get into spoilers 
Nope, I think it's spoilers time. Okay, it's spoilers time. Warning, warning, Danger Will Robinson. Spoilers are incoming. If you have not seen the first part of, which is what they're calling seasons, because Netflix lets them decide what they're calling things. Yay! Which also leads me to believe that this is a completed story, that they know the beginning, middle, and end, and there is an end date for the series, and it's not intended to be an ongoing series. To me, that's the difference when I see part versus um, season, that generally tends to be what that means. Not always, but generally. But if you haven't seen part one, all the way through, we will be talking about spoilers, including a really big spoiler that I didn't see coming. One twist that I did not see coming, and when it happened, it blew my mind. Stop now, pause, go watch every episode, and come back. Okay? You ready? All right. Okay. I, I want to go immediately to Varvatos Vex and his vengeance fixation and the fact that he betrayed the royal family. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Um, that was an interesting little twist to throw out there. And it was, it was also done at a good time because you had just enough information. Like, once it hit, I went... Oh, I think I understand already why he did it. And, and I was right. I guess why he, I, I understood why he did it and his regrets and everything. But still, it was just like, wow. You and know. It's the kind of thing that I, again, this is one of the things that I think Netflix has been doing that's been really good for what I would consider family entertainment. They're really getting good at family entertainment as opposed to just children's programming. I think most of the shows, the DreamWorks, they're, they're doing with DreamWorks, from Voltron to the original Troll Hunter to even Race for the Edge, are family shows that the, the parents won't be like, oh, the kid wants to watch the show because the jokes are legitimately funny. Yeah. And, you know, the stakes are interesting and have consequences in the story in a way that you don't expect from a lot of children's programming. Like this isn't G1 Transformers, which I'm rewatching again and it's, Oh, glorious cheese. I love it. <laughs> but you know, there really are no stakes in that show because somebody gets injured. They're of course going to get repaired. You know, the, yeah. you know that you're watching something that is relatively safe. Well, like back to the death where one of the, one of the bounty hunters is killed and dead and they, they don't dwell on it, which is nice, because they don't want to... It kept the show from going dark, which the the type of level of the show... Yeah, yeah, it's somewhat dark, but not like, I don't know, emo well, dark. And so you get this... The bounty hunter's dead, and they have a funeral. They, they make him all glowy and fly up in the air, and then they shoot and explode. So the bits of him are spread mm -hmm. everywhere. And so it was kind of quick. It wasn't like a... It was kind of their version of the funeral pyre and spreading the ashes. Um, you know... And and that's why we were earlier when we were talking about the types of death, it was like it wasn't like Deadpool gory death, and it wasn't you know emo dwelling on death, you know it was just kind of this. Yes, it was. Yes, we had a body, but it was quick and dealt with, and so for adults, there were consequences. And the events with their mother and father, with the king and queen of Vecaridian Five, they're not dead; they're in stasis, being regenerated. But that was. A heart-wrenching scene the way it was animated yeah the way the characters reacted to it you know having to basically drag their the you know be sure to escape with their parents cores so that their parents weren't dead dead that that was that hit me emotionally hard and that's in the very beginning that's the first episode yeah yeah that's the very beginning of the series and that's what I'm saying when I'm talking about family entertainment. This is something I think that, you know, anybody can get something out of. Yeah, because the kids can see it. And they're also learning their arts. Uh, that's the other thing I, I like is that, you know, because of not wanting to shock kids by having them face concepts of death and dying early on, they unfortunately often learn that violence doesn't have consequences. And this one shows these violent acts have consequences. The king and queen are reduced to their cores. And have to be regenerated, they're gone the entire season. You know, this bounty hunter that takes that blast point blank to the chest is dead and gone. You know, that that these, you know, unlike in like Transformers and G.I. Joe and stuff growing up, they shot a bunch of lasers at each other and they're back fine, you know, an episode or two la later. 
it's like uh no <laughs> i think that's a good way to actually sum up most of season of part one there are consequences to your actions yeah because that seems to be the recurring theme of season one of part one and we'll talk about that a little bit more after the break and we're back and i really do mean what we said just before the break you know that this season really felt like it was about consequences because and it's with everything the concept what are the consequences of steve finding out that they're aliens and there's some very interesting not really political but kind of political like the first thing the first to me most political thing is when mother the ship gives them their bodies finds three things that are ignored on this planet and creates a girl a latino and a senior citizen yeah that just hit me in the face yeah yeah it was, it was very poignantly put but you know kind of kind of true it just that that just blew my mind that 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 wow and then of course the whole immigration fiasco that happens about midway through where the bounty hunter pretends to be from the school board yeah which I also really liked how they handled it because that's a, that, you know, it's a delicate subject to touch on. And by having Senior Rule uh, championing, you know, the, you know, we, they're not illegal aliens. They're refugees. That, they're refugees. And, and really, it was so well handled because he was able to take that, be there and, and make sure that the, the whole subject matter is not... You know, is 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 shown from a good perspective and not just an us versus them or, you know, anything like that. And really helped to humanize Senior Ool in a way that he wasn't in the Troll Hunters series. Yeah. But the whole thing with what is it, Area sixty two B or forty? <laughs> they, they're Area fifty one. Yeah, they're Area fifty one. Uh, um, yeah. First of all, I have to say. I, I hope they don't get sued by um, Warner Brothers because I'm sorry, uh, oh, the the uh, oh the lady heading it up that's Amanda Waller yeah yeah <laughs> that, that is clearly when, Amanda Waller yeah you know, when she came into the scene I was like oh beautiful Amanda Waller step stand in but you know that's probably enough difference you know she's not named Amanda Waller you know they they could always throw the race card back at them and just saying hey well you think all these you know all black women are amanda waller then you know you know i don't know there's ways they could defend versus you know warner brothers for the character but you know because she didn't have a uh, a suicide squad of factions but as far Give as time as far as temperament and attitude when she came on the scene it was you know the whole like, hey, when you show up at somebody's house, you knock and introduce yourself. And by the way, you were never invited into our house in the first place. And uh -huh. we're, going to, we're going to destroy you now. It was like, it was an interesting twist on the um, human paranoia from alien, you know, versus aliens, um, and, and and an interesting twist to make it more dark, and yet. You know, on some level, you know, it almost resonates where you're going, yeah, but this is for the protection of Earth. But, you know, it's like, well, yes, it's the protection of Earth, but she's doing it to the extreme of um, blindly ignoring and assuming all intentions of everyone else. And it also resonated with me in a way that uh, I just lost her name. The character from Supergirl that was brought in to run the DEO. Yeah. Yeah, her, yeah, a bit like her as well. Also known as not Amanda Waller, wink, wink. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really, I thought it was fun because, you know, up to this point, the alien tech, of course, way outweighs the human tech. And, you know, you get into this area and you suddenly realize they've been reverse, they've been collecting, studying and reverse engineering alien tech for, for over 50 years and have advanced weaponry and tech that goes beyond what the aliens have. Like the, I loved how, you know, they, they use that and she just starts mocking them. Oh, that tech was so 50 years ago. We already have ways around it. And like, just blammy. Um, yeah. That's a very good way to put it. And blammy. <laughs> just blammy, you know, but, but it was a nice touch and also a fun part because when 
the um the general general uh i know making i mean colonel colonel yeah i was actually because i can never remember to say the actress's name right it's a uh, Cur- colonel um Kubritz, which is a fun play off of Kubrick. Um, yeah, who is played by uh, U- Uzo Aduba, who you might know as Crazy Eyes from Orange is the New Black. She's also a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful character on Steven Universe. Yeah. And I love her. And, oh, she is scary. She is Amanda Waller, and all kinds of craziness ensues. But, yeah, her character is... Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm also talking about the the general who invaded the. the oh yeah. Oh, Miranda. Miranda, that's it. Yeah, General Miranda. Um, like at the end, when General Mando's like, "Well, we're just gonna go to this mud hole and and you know conquer it and take the king and queen." And I'm sitting back thinking, "Uh, yeah, you're in for a surprise when you run into that that section because they might yeah. have more advanced weaponry and stomp the invading force." They might quite easily there there's so much there's so much going on with this series and can i just say tatiana maslavi we haven't mentioned her yet because you know our previous orphan black coverage she does the (laughs) she does the voice of aja and i just have to say i think she was also the voice of the lamp i think she was also the voice of the um I was, ship doors she was the was, voice of every i was waiting to hear it. yeah i kept and, listening to be like okay so how many characters are you gonna play <laughs> you know um, because yeah she she's tatiana maslavi and we expect her to play like three million characters uh she did play aja and apparently the queen so she played both the mother and the daughter so that's two characters on the show so, she only two. Double checking here because she is Tatiana Maslavi, and um, she played like yeah. virtually the entire cast on Orphan Black. Did a brilliant with a job exceptions. with it, but yeah, 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 was, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you you got to mention her. The the, I I really like the humor that the show has. I I the sense of fun that they brought into it the characters especially the overlap when um Rovados vex falls in love that may be one of the greatest things i have ever seen in an animated series <laughs> just because the way they've written for Vados vex and the way nick offerman plays him he is so just anger and rage and intense. fighting. Yes. Intense is the word. Because yes. everyone else goes, man, you're intense. Yeah. All the other geezers are like, man, you're intense. And he's just like, he's like, I shall slay you. Man, you're intense. <laughs> uh, he, he's, it's just so funny. Uh, and the fact that he falls in love. I can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was, uh, I was losing it. Oh, with, oh, with his mom. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny because you know she being so blind that she doesn't even that she thinks the gnome is a cat it's just like it's kind of perfect in a way because this way if his if his illusion falls at all she's not gonna she's, she's gonna, not gonna know she's, she's not gonna half see blind it. anyway she's more um, than half blind by the way <laughs> if you're like me and a fan of gnome chomsky because he's one of my favorite oh, characters from troll gnome hunters chomsky. gnome chomsky gets a feature episode which I'm sure, because you're in spoilers, you already know that. But if you haven't watched and you're just listening to the spoilers like I do sometimes to see if you want to watch the show, Noam Chomsky gets a feature episode it's where gl- he is put up against Vervato's Vex in glorious, glorious Battle. battle. <laughs> and it is one of the greatest things. Oh, it, it is, is so good. It is so awesome. Because Vervato's is pursuing combat with a little human, as he keeps calling Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky just wants a gift for his his wife, girlfriend, significant other. Uh, I don't know what to call the Barbie doll. But, you know, the I, dude's I, in love. So, he's he's hey, very much in love. Very much in love. And he, he does glorious battle with Barbaltos Vex. He does. A to, glorious battle. Glorious battle. And, to, uh, to try to acquire this gift for his beloved. <laughs> Um, speaking of voice talent, because they're just names that keep popping up in this series that I just can't believe. 
but Glenn Close is the mother, voice of mother, the mm-hmm. ship's computer. Glenn Close yeah. is the voice of mother on the show, and that that just baggles my mind. Frank Welker, if you know, if you're if you're a Transformers fan like I am, Frank Welker, man, Frank Welker is the voice of Luke. Yeah. You know, Luke was also just incredible and a pleasant surprise because it was kind of like the analog for the pet dog, uh, except for um, he urinates laser beams. And uh, poops <laughs> so, them. Yeah, and poops laser beams. Because at the, one yeah. point they kind of hold him up and lasers are shooting out of his tuchus and they, yeah. he does say, we have been saved by your intestinal fortitude. Yes. So, yeah. That, that, yeah. That's... Or as Varvatos later says, you know, a, a most prolific theft or stealer of pancakes who also has a deadly result or something like that. <laughs> yes. It was a glorious scene. Because, <laughs> uh, well, Luke swipes the pancake right off his plate and hand and, and eats his hand a little and then fires a laser blast <laughs> in the kitchen again. And Frank Walker also did other voices, but IMDb is not working at the moment. I was trying to get all of the characters that he did, but I, I was surprised and quite happy to see him on the show. Uh, okay, here we are, three below. Lug, Lug, oh, he's just credited as additional voices. So, yeah. But, you know, you, you have to love Frank Walker. He's been in the business for a very long time, and it was great to see him in this show you know it just i really liked this i i really like this show yeah um i don't know if i like it as much as i like troll hunters troll hunters has a very special place in my heart yeah um, and and also having seen troll hunters it really enhanced the experience of this it show it really did because you know as we said earlier there's there's not only the crossover when they're trying to get the lightning in the bottle from merlin they there's Early on, they they actually ran into the Troll Hunters earlier, but the whole thing gets memory wiped. Yeah. And that was just, it was really awesome getting to see them meet each other and and run around together. Yeah. Um, you know, and kind of, fig- you know, figuring out who each other is, you but, know. Yeah, they cross paths, paths a couple times, and it's really interesting. The Battle of the Bands, getting a completely different view on the Battle of the Bands was fun. I, yeah. I, all in all... I think it was a good show. Mm-hmm. It was far in a way better than I thought it would be as a sequel series, especially as the first season of a sequel series. Yeah. Because especially when I saw that they were going to be doing these overlaps, like I figured that we would meet Aja and Krell on earth sometime after the eternal night. Yeah. That, you know, well, we've already had them established in, you know, the final season of, um, Troll Hunter, we're going to re-meet them sometime after the, you know, battle to stop the Endless Night. And that's not what happened. And I was really concerned when I realized that it was going to be overlapping like this because you have to fit the events of your story into a set chronology from another story. Yeah. And I thought that that could have really backfired on them. And I was re- just really happy at how it all worked together. And that's what was brilliantly done because this way they could have certain outlandish things like a spaceship launching and nobody noticing because while the spaceship is launching, well, the eternal night events are going on. Yes. There's this giant pillar thing of, fire and smoke or whatever blocking out the sun shooting out of the earth like everyone's staring at that so they don't notice over their left shoulder behind them a spaceship taking off and getting slammed into by a second spaceship which is actually quite fitting from the themes of troll hunter that while the battle of killahead bridge was going on merlin and morgana were off in the corner fighting but nobody noticed nobody knew that that the, fight that was fight happening was... at the same time as the fight on Killahead Bridge. Yeah. And so it does actually fit very well into Troll into the Troll Hunter world that way. I like the different aliens that they've introduced us to. I can't wait to see where that goes. I am a bit concerned with uh, next season with uh, Mirando coming to Earth and how that's going to play out. Well, that's, and what that's going to look like. I'm wondering if a bit of that's actually going to start off more like we originally thought, where it's going to be 
Pepper Jack and trying to sleuth in the aliens and accidentally seeding information to 52B. Which, well, that's one of the last things in the know, season, which is, is he yeah, gets pictures he actually of gets pictures. Krell on the spaceship. And we know that any of that stuff posted to the internet, they sh- they show up to investigate. Yeah. So that may draw them back to Arcadia. And, I, you know, if I were to guess, that would there would be a lot of that stuff in the beginning. And then... Yeah. Leading up to the invasion force, probably getting crushed. <laughs> I, I kind of want a little bit more crossover with Troll Hunter than, you know, and especially now that we're post, you know, the events of Troll Hunter as a series and the characters aren't locked into specific events as much. I would like a little bit more crossover because they are still going to Arcadia Oaks High. So we are going to be able to spend more time with the kids in school and stuff like that. I think that that would be a lot more fun. Maybe some of the other characters that we didn't get as much time with in the um, Troll Hunter series. And even, you know, some of the Troll Hunters characters who, let's face it, would, as soon as they got a whiff of the stuff happening, would be involved because they still have Merlin's armor and weapons. So that to my mind, has to play a role going forward, especially with Mirando coming to Earth, because, you know, they would be good allies in the fight. Yeah. That, and let's let's be honest, I need another episode with Arg and Vervatos going after each other. Oh, yeah. That That, that is the... <laughs> Arg and Vervatos. That was the greatest buddy set that I've seen in a show in a very long time, and I, I need more of that. Yeah. Our Arg and Vervatos need to be buddies. Oh, yeah. They really do. Yeah. Well, Vervatos could learn so much from Arg because yes. Arg is kind of like a calmed down like, version of Vervatos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. After Buddhist training version of Vervatos. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. So I think that's a bit. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I. So for the secret of the burrito. No. <laughs> Yeah, they need to reveal that because you know it's some alien pepper. That's why it's so hot. Yeah. So, yeah, if you haven't seen it, definitely see it. You know, we don't do star ratings or anything like that, just whether or not it's a watch or not. Definitely a watcher. Definitely a watcher. Definitely a watcher. Very good series. Enjoyed it a lot. If you have enjoyed this episode and the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either the episode or the podcast itself, please do that. That helps me out a lot. That tells the algorithm that, well, it should share me to other people. If you've got a buck, you can pass my way. Depending on the app that you're listening to me on, there'll either be a button that says support or in the show notes, there will be a link that says support on Anchor. If you click that, you can support at the $1, $5, or $10 levels. That money does help out a lot. Thanks to you, I was able to buy vellum so that the books are going to look awesome and not take me a week to do. Just just doing the exports. So... Thank you all so much for that. I was also able to buy some new map making software. So be looking over at ashdancer.com for maps because they're going to be like old school D&D maps. Because yeah. I, I, I have a problem. Y'all know that. Anywho. But thank you all for helping to make that possible. Um, if you don't have any money or you don't feel like giving right now, that's fine. Just, you know, share me with other people. That would be awesome. Or, you know, whatever. Yeah. No skin off my teeth. Anywho, uh, let's see. You can follow me on social media. I'm C.E. Dorset on Twitter. It's probably the best place to find me. You can find links to everything that I do over at projectshadow.com. And until next time, I'm Charlie. I'm Brian. And don't forget, have the fun.